All right, let's get started here. Really excited to welcome everyone to our webinar presentation. This is the first in a series of webinars that we're going to be uh, conducting to talk about how business owners can get uh, more diligent ready for a potential private equity transaction or exit. Um, really excited to have our sponsors here, um, Catherine from Paycor and Dan from Alliant. Uh, if you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick, we'll kind of kick this off. Perfect. I'll start. Well, thanks so much for including me. Um, just a quick hello. My name is Catherine Cecil. I'm a principal sales executive at Paycor. Um, if you have not heard from us, we offer a fully unified human capital management platform that is purpose built for leaders. So we understand that great leaders both drive employee engagement and productivity. So our goal is to simplify their administrative tasks so those leaders can then focus on building uh, winning teams. And they do that by leveraging our specialized tools and technology. Um, we support the lower and middle market. Um, I will be on for the whole call. So happy to be a resource and please feel free to ping me with any questions that you have. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again, Will, for uh, coordinating this and setting it up and letting Alliant be a part of it. Uh, just for those of you on the call that don't know about Alliance, uh, Alliance is a full service insurance and risk management brokerage. Uh, we're top five globally in terms of revenue, and we're headquartered in Irvine, California. We're privately held with 51% of our ownership being uh, belonging to our employees, with the other 49% being held by our private equity sponsor. Uh, the, the unique ownership structure of Alliant allows us to always put our clients first and gives us a, a deep understanding of the unique needs of our private equity clients. Uh, my partner, Jennifer, who's also on the call, uh, her and I work closely with family offices, independent sponsors, and other private equity firms uh, in the lower to upper middle market space. Prior to joining Alliant, Jennifer spent 17 years on the private equity side and sits within our M&A private equity team where she leads insurance due diligence as well as insurance placement for transactional liability, including reps and warranties. Uh, for myself, uh, I spent 10 years as an underwriter prior to joining Alliant, uh, focusing on healthcare and life sciences. At Alliant, I lead a team that works with high growth and PE-backed companies in the life sciences and healthcare ecosystem, and also work with a variety of clients that have high hazard manufacturing exposure, exposures. Uh, Jennifer and I are often brought in during the RFP process uh, when private equity firms go to market for their property and casualty as well as benefits needs. Uh, we'd love to discuss further with anyone on the call. Feel free to ping us with questions and or uh, set up some time with us uh, for a subsequent call later. Thanks again. Thanks, Dan. Um, I appreciate everyone hopping on. I know uh, Jordan uh, uh, is at a conference, and so we're really grateful for you to carve out some time for us. Um, I want to introduce Jordan uh, Buxton Punch with uh, Gen X360 Equity Partners. Yeah, how is it, everybody? Are, are you able to hear me okay? All good. Sounds good. Perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Will, you know, Catherine, Dan, uh, you know, Joseph, a tremendous group of people to, to be a part of this opportunity with. Um, Gen X is a private equity group focusing on control uh, buyout transactions. Um, you know, that phrase kind of gets a misnomer in the industry. Um, we're really a capital partner. Uh, fiduciarily, we do um, need to maintain an element of 51% or greater in equity for our LPs. But from an operational standpoint, we actually go to market, um, you know, really hand in glove with our management teams, our executive leadership, uh, and our board members. Um, and we work with family-owned companies, privately held companies uh, looking to grow uh, and looking to do so in a, in a pretty momentous and dynamic fashion. Um, we have a tremendous kind of 20-year history really focusing first on manufacturing and industrial companies and most recently uh, actually thinking through how to apply our acumen and our, and our expertise from an investment perspective to the services sector. And so the services obviously is a wide array of, of um, has a wide array of end markets, but we focus on healthcare, food services, um, life sciences, pharma, uh, industrials, man, you know, other manufacturing services, uh, aerospace and defense, the list goes on. Um, 
you know, from our perspective, we are, can't make a good investment without partnering with good people. And so, you know, I was hired as the director uh, for business development about four months ago to make sure that we have significant coverage, not only of the intermediaries that inevitably folks like you all will end up working with in order to kind of get to folks like me, but also to make sure that we're direct uh, and we form direct relationships with business owners and managers, uh, you know, across the country in various industries, um, ensuring that we're able to differentiate our capital um, given how commoditized and how aggressive the market is. We're able to differentiate our capital by, by going to market really, um, you know, ahead of processes and building relationships with management teams over time. Um, you know, finally, my background personally, uh, you know, I was a banker for uh, four years, both an analyst and an associate. I then uh, led a book of business, a $15 million investment fund focused on venture uh, investments in the life sciences and healthcare space for about four years, uh, doing everything from origination through execution and implementation. Um, and so, you know, sitting in this chair now from a business development perspective allows me to be, you know, thoughtful about what, what opportunities we focus on, but also put myself, you know, in the seats of managers and the seats of business owners um, and help articulate a story, right? And position an opportunity for our investment team to focus on when, when they partner with, with inevitably folks like you guys. Um, hopefully that was a, a not too long of an introduction, uh, but we'll happy to take any questions or kick it off however you'd like. Yeah, no, thanks, Jordan. That's a great overview. Um, and I think uh, a, a big question on a lot of business owners' minds kind of is, you know, what can business owners do to make their company more attractive to, to private equity investment? Yeah, so that's, um, that's a great, it's a great place to start. I don't know if, you know, I am smart enough or have enough time uh, to really answer that in as great a detail as it probably deserves. Um, but I, I can say that one of the things that, you know, I've noticed, one of the key details that I've noticed is conviction around your business model. Um, we, you know, our job on, on the buy side is to sniff out, you know, and really map out, form out the architecture of a business reverse engineer it down to the nuts and bolts in terms of how it was built and then try to recreate that infrastructure on paper so that we can map out a growth plan, how to extend that infrastructure in any given area, whether it's sales, marketing, um, you know, capitalization, right? So in order for us to really commence and, and fulfill that process, we need to have a clear and coherent foundation in order to understand value, and understand future opportunities. If the business is not focused um, on what it does, right? Or if it's not convicted in how it goes to market. Um, and by those things, I know they're a little kind of amorphous. So let me put some, some meat on those bones. Uh, if you're a distribution company focusing on gardening products and during COVID you decided to sell masks, awesome. Very innovative, great way to keep the doors open. Um, however, you know, long term, now that we're four or five years removed, if we still see that revenue on the income statement when we're going to understand your business, we're either going to have to carve that out or we're going to have to think of the business as more of a diversified kind of products distributor and figure out how those two products can, can kind of go hand in hand or fit within the same company. Because likely they're being sourced from different places. They're being sold to different entities. You know, maybe you were selling mass direct to consumer and you're a wholesale gardening products distributor. And so you probably have different forms of contracts, different. So there's a lot of different things that go into not having conviction around a business model and maybe not understanding, uh, you know, the true nature of the business that individuals, certainly family owned businesses are trying to, to, to execute. Yeah, that's awesome, Jordan. It's it's a, it's a good point. You know, if you have some you know, revenue stream that maybe isn't exactly um, key to the to the the business itself, uh, that might be something that a private equity fund would take a look at during due diligence. Can can you kind of help uh, help us understand what does your due diligence process look like? Um, don't have to go into painstaking detail, but just kind of you know what does that process look like? Sure, absolutely. So you know, from a diligence perspective. 
Um, I think every company is is probably diligence differently. Uh, I will say there are probably some main archetypes. Um, first of all, I would highly recommend that business owners, uh, when they're considering entering in, into a process, make sure there's an infrastructure, like a management team, whether it's a COO or a chief of staff or other folks that are in the brain trust. Um, you know, I would open that up in terms of them understanding there's a transaction imminent and that there's certain you know, work to be required. Uh, I think business owners sometimes underestimate the amount of time it takes to run a process, um, particularly when you wanna maximize value on your end. If we're gonna be one of five or 10 or 15 shops, you know, that's five or 10 or 15 times the meetings and the, the conversation. So really time management and understanding that in order for us to really write the check and provide the proceeds that you're looking for, we need and are likely going to be, um, you know, very meticulous about the questions and about the time that we spend understanding. So not shortcutting the process and making sure you have enough resources is the first piece of any diligence process, because it's going to take a while from there. Um, they can differ, but the main thing I would say is have as many details as av available, get drilled down as, as low as you can um, in terms of, you know, revenue and income statement and balance sheet, uh, in terms of business model, it's always great to have a presentation, even if you're not in market yet, some type of executive summary so we can understand the business from a, you know, uh, again, from a formulaic or from a, uh, an infrastructure perspective. And then finally, you know, if you're going to allocate two to five or two to six months for any process, you know, could be longer. Um, I would say really understand what you want to get out of the process. Um some, 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 some individuals go to market and then take the asset off market uh, because they're not sure they actually want to trade. Some individuals go to market and maybe, you know, are looking for more than, than just a capital, but they're looking for a partner. They're looking for other things. So get what you want to get out of, out of the diligence process as well, because you really have only one or twice, or, you know, if you're lucky opportunity to run this type of um, event in your life. And it's going to be probably the, 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 the thing that sets you up from a wealth perspective. Um, so really understand how you want to approach it. Ask the questions, you know, don't leave any stone unturned because certainly on the other end of the table, we won't either. Yeah. I mean, it makes, that makes perfect sense. Or, and I appreciate that your candor and, and disclosure there. Um, can you kind of help us understand a little bit more about, um, you know, when you're in that, when you, when you look at a potential investment opportunity, you know, from your investor lens, like what is like a, a red flag or something that is, you know, that, that will catch your eye, whether it's like, you know, something in the financial statements or non-financial, like, can you maybe uh, tell us a time where it's like, okay, we saw something that was just like, wow, this could have been, you know, easily avoided had the business owner had the proper advise advisory services. Yeah, so so that's a that's a great question. I, I spoke earlier about the, the you know proprietary nature of 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 kind of going to not only talking to guys like Joseph um, on the banking side, but also trying to talk directly to business owners, which this conversation is full of. Um, within that, I think you know what I maybe undersold is that the best processes are, like I said before, the ones that have conviction and the ones that uh, that, that, that have a clear and concise goal, right? Um, and oftentimes you can't get to that space if, if the business owner is the one taking their asset to market. And I find that guys like Joseph, um, bankers who are experts in their respective industries or generalists um, who, are, who are financial experts, valuation experts, who are strategic experts, do a great job of identifying for business owners and alongside business owners what it is that they want to get out of the process, whether it's value or partnership or, you know, operational infrastructure, and then helping carve out or target shops, private equity groups, you know, capital groups that can facilitate that. Um, I think it is, uh, it's, you know, akin to walking into a courtroom, God forbid, and not having a lawyer is, is likely, you know, the same as walking into a process and not having a banker. Right. Um, you know, I, I think private equity groups oftentimes um, are able to maximize efficiency um, and maximize our opportunity to close a deal and become a partner of a of a uh, of a business owner 
when there's an expert that's not hand-holding, but guiding professionally and with expertise um, the individual towards that, towards that goal. And that's not always to say that I think we need to run processes with 50 and 100 groups. Um, I think there's still a space for business owners to create relationships directly with capital providers like myself and like other private equity groups, um, because it takes a while to get comfortable with somebody, right? But within that process, once you identify groups that, that you're comfortable with, or once you identify groups that you want to build relationships with over time, you know, working with a, with a guy like jo Joseph can, can make the process a lot easier because they can identify structure and really form conviction around the story that is ultimately going to create the proceeds that is the foundation of the family wealth. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense, Jordan. I mean, it's, you know, without having the proper uh, advisor or expert on staff, it's going to make it a difficult uh, process. And it sounds like, you know, folks that are just going to market to kind of test what the EBITDA multiples are, what the valuation is, that it might be not the best idea if you are looking for a capital provider. Yeah, look, I mean, to that, again, I would say um, there are, are, are shops that do that. Uh, I think the the best thing that, you know, we can do in this market, which is hyper competitive as an industry, when we think about uh, growth and when we think about providing capital is communicate, right? Uh, communicate and, and, and invest time in understanding what it is that you want from a given process or a given structure, and then really surrounding yourself as the leader of an organization with the expertise to achieve that goal. And, and oftentimes, you know, I can't think of a situation where, um, you know, we would have preferred the banker not be associated. Because I think there's a lot of noise and a lot of um, red tape and a lot of uh, distractions when you're doing a deal on either side of the table. And to have as many qualified individuals to help guide that process there as possible is, is ideal. Um, and we certainly look for that type of structure and that type of rigor when we, when we look for partners, um, again, whether it's through bankers or through executives, you always want to have somebody there that can, can sort of guide that internally uh, and with conviction. I appreciate that, Jordan. And I know you got to hop here soon, but I, th I think uh, it'd be helpful for the audience just to kind of hear from your own mouth. You know, what what does an ideal investment opportunity look like for you? Yeah, for us specifically, it's going to be uh, one that has at least five million of EBITDA if we're looking at it as a platform. But if we're thinking about it as a bolt on to an operational asset that we already own in our portfolio, as long as the uh, asset is profitable. Um, you know, there's no point in not having a conversation, right? Um, you know, I think too often we look at the market as competitive with one another. And I, I think there are more opportunities to collaborate, um, you know, for, again, in the services sector, there's so many different end markets. Our portfolio itself has 14 assets in it that run the gamut from power generation through aerospace and defense all the way to you know marine manufacturing and and, and repair and replacement parts, um, and so we can likely find a place to have a conversation, uh, or find or rather find a time to have a conversation, or find a place for your asset um, in terms of whether it's our portfolio or you know folks that I know. Um, there, there, I think you know there's no point in not reaching out again. Uh, there's no point in in not communicating to the best of our abilities and, and as clear and concise as we can. Um, and so, you know, even if you don't know or think it's perfect for us, um, you know, drop me a line, shoot me an email. We can have a 15, 20 minute conversation about why it could or could not fit. Um, at, at, at the very top of the market, you know, we think we're running investing out of an $800 million fund at the very top of the, the, the kind of lower middle market. Um, and so out of $800 million, we're, you know, we're trying to probably put that to work over the course of three to four years um, and then hold periods with three to four years uh, and then to create proceeds that are, you know, three and a half to four times. Right. So we call it our three and a half, three and a half, three and a half model. Uh, and the reason that's important is, again, you know, we are trying to, to create wealth alongside of business owners and, and on behalf of, of family owned assets. Um, and so we want you guys to be as confident in our investment model and as clear about our goals and our targets as we uh, would want for you. 
um, when we're doing or diligencing your opportunity, because we know that this partnership is is important uh, to the family. It's important to the business that you're ultimately exiting um, over some period of time. Uh, and it's important to us and our LPs as we look to to kind of grow these assets along with you. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate the time and hopping on. And and folks, uh, Jordan is a is a great resource to have in your network. He's always open to a conversation, and he, he's a great connector within uh, the capital market. So, uh, really appreciate your time, Jordan. Yeah, absolutely, guys. I got to hop, but um, you got, you guys can get my information from Will. Uh, and you know, you're you're in great hands with this panel, Will. Again, thank you and the Escalon team for putting this together. It's always great to to know who's out there and who's looking to to do a deal. So, I look forward to talking to you guys soon. All right. Cheers. Um, thanks, Jordan. And then uh, on, on the other side, you know, the the uh, the, the uh, kind of diligence process, your, your advisor, uh, Joseph, I wanted to take a moment to thank you for your time. And maybe if you want to give a quick intro on, on yourself and, and, and Intrepid, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, no, thanks, Will. Appreciate you and the Escalon team putting this together and, and having me on today. Uh, so I'm with Intrepid Investment Bankers, and we're an investment banking advisory firm. And ba basically what that means is that we work with companies to pursue various types of transactions. And, and we advise the management team and the ownership group through those, those transactions. Uh, the majority of, of the deals and clients that we work on or with are entrepreneurs and founder-owned businesses um, that are going through what's called a sell side transaction where they're selling typically a majority stake in in the business to either a large strategic acquirer or a, a private equity firm like like jordan's firm who's who's just speaking a few minutes ago um, and then a, a, another piece of, of of the work that we do is other I'd, I'd say other types of transactions outside of a traditional sale uh, that includes raising debt capital from a, a lender to either take cash out of the business or invest in growth, uh, new equity capital coming in where you're you know, investing in a new service line or making an acquisition. Um, we also have a team that works on restructurings and special situations. If, if a company is, is having issues with a lender and needs to work through that process and we can help with refinancings and things like that. But the way to think of us is we're there throughout a company's life cycle to, to guide the team through, through the capital markets and through, through capital events. Um, I personally work within our, our healthcare group here at Intrepid. Uh, we have industry groups across the economy, across industrials, software, technology, consumer, um, and you know, I'd say pretty broad coverage across the market. Um, our typical, you know, I mentioned we're typically working with with entrepreneurs. Our typical client is is somewhere in the you know five to ten million of EBITDA and up, uh, but we'll of, often get introduced to folks years in advance of the transaction. So, we're a lot of the relationships that we maintain are with with organizations that are you know two, three, four, five million of EBITDA. As we're helping them think through growth strategies and how to position the business for a sale. Or, or a, you know a growth capital raise down down the road. Um, I, I'm personally based in Los Angeles, where Intrepid is headquartered. Um, we're actually part of the seventh largest bank in the world, the, the largest bank in Japan called MUFG. Um, you, you may know the name Mitsubishi Bank. That, that's kind of the, the the parent company of Intrepid. You know they're a great resource to us. They have a, a, a global presence and they're lending to some of the top names across healthcare, industrial, software, across, across the, the total market. So, um, you know, we're entrepreneur focused, but have the, the global reach of, of one of the largest banks in the world. Yeah, that's fantastic, Joseph. And, and appreciate the, the background on Intrepid there. Um, I think a question burning in a lot of business owners' minds is like, what, what's kind of the first step to think about if, if you're, you've got a successful business that you've built, um, you know, and, and maybe you're thinking about an exit, like what, what's that first step look like? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, first it's, it's important to align yourself with, with the right advisors. And, you know, one of the first things we do when working with a company is making sure that they have the right deal team in place. And so that includes, investment banking advisor, 
the accounting advisors like Escalon who can help you get the, the accounting side of things together and, and prepare on the, on the financial side so that you have a smooth transaction process down the road. Uh, the legal uh, advisors, um, estate and wealth management is, is critical. And that's one that we want to get in as early as possible because they can do um, certain you know, tax planning and, and estate planning initiatives that often need to be thought of years in advance of, of a sale. Um, but, but once the, the team is in place, uh, you know, what's, what's important in, in a transaction, and every situation is different, but it really comes down to what are the goals of, of the founder, of the team, of the company? And, you know, are, is, the, is the shareholder base older and looking to, to sell to a strategic 100% of equity, walk away and kind of, you know, go spend time in, in Hawaii or on the beach? Or is this more of a growth oriented transaction where you want to bring in a partner that's going to bring capital to the business, allow the existing shareholder base to retain significant ownership in the company and, and support growth over the next five, six, seven years. And, and so every situation is a little bit different, but it, it all comes back to, um, you know, what the, the, the intent of the transaction is. Is it just to, to sell for the highest price and walk away or to, to really find the, the, the right partner that's going to position the business for the next decade? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great response, and it's uh, something that should be on everyone's mind. You have a kind of you know with the end goal in mind, right? Um, coming yeah. to that point, Joseph, like, what do you you know when should a business owner consider a discussion with the, an investment banker or an advisor? You know, I, I think I think earlier early is always better. The you know there's there's clients that we're working with today that we've known for seven, eight, nine years. There's other folks on, on my team that, um, you know, are working with companies they've been working with for 20 plus years. And, it, you know, it, when you have the relationship and you build the trust over a period of, of not just days and months and you know, weeks, it's over years, you can really be an advisor and, and help think through how to position the business for a transaction. Because what makes sense to an entrepreneur as far as running the business and investing in certain initiatives may look and feel a lot different to an institutional investor that's looking to triple, quadruple the, the size of the business over a handful of years. And so, you know, there's things given each of our industry groups are very in tune with our respective market sectors and industries. We know what the investment investor base is looking for in a what we consider a, a high quality investment, a high quality platform. And you know, it, it all comes back to in, in a transaction, there's there's the, the base earnings and then there's the multiple. And you know, that's what drives valuation. And you know, you can there's things you can do to grow earnings and that may or may not influence the multiple. If, if you grow earnings significantly, but that increases client concentration, that may re reduce the multiple, you may end up in, this, in a similar position from an overall enterprise value position. Uh, but if you look at certain growth initiatives that actually reduce the underlying risk profile of the business and of a transaction, that may increase the, the multiple. And so a comparable level of earnings or you know, modest growth on the earning side may may still drive a stronger increase on the multiple and, and drive more valuation. So the, the earlier we get involved, and I'd say, you know, best case, we're in there three plus years in advance, and we can really plan out and sit down and model the next three, four years, what the base core business will look like, what various growth initiatives may look like as they ramp up. Um, thinking through the management team, if if it's an older shareholder base, older management team that's looking to step aside as part of a transaction, can we recruit a high caliber CEO, CFO, uh, chief development officer to look at potential acquisitions to the business so that two, three years down the road, that that executive team is is wrapped up with the business and a new investor coming in can, can get behind them and 
and support the next next phase of growth. Um, but I would say, although it's great to get introduced early, we're that's not always the case. And you know, at a minimum, you know, when when you, we get introduced, uh, there's there's some prep work that goes into getting ready to to pursue a transaction, and then the actual transaction process takes takes some time. So all in, you know, working backwards, the latest, you know, we typically get it brought in is about a year prior to the, the closing of a transaction because the transaction process takes six to nine months. And then there's, there's some prep work that, that goes in on, on the front end, which we can talk about. Yeah, I think you make a good point, Joseph. And, and I think a lot of business owners kind of think that, you know, the investment banking banker's role is kind of to come in in, in the 11th hour right before a transaction. But it kind of sounds like it's the exact opposite. Like the the earlier you can get involved, the more value you can you can add to a transaction and the, and the more smoothly that transition will go, um, which kind of segues us into a, our first question from the audience from Aaron. Um, he, he has a... a, a the company, two major service providers want to acquire, um, and it looks like the software team released the solution recently. Maybe he's in some kind of unsolicited LOI thing from a, an investor. Um, what What do you think particularly about Aaron's uh, uh, company? And and uh, given their revenue is is less than a million, is that is this some is this a situation that um, an investment banker would add value, or you you guys would add value? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think. What I understood about from from what you shared there around the question is, he Aaron has a software company that he is looking to acquire or just acquired another business, and and now there's some interest from an investor to come buy or invest in the, in the business. Is that right? No, sorry, I I, I was a little jumbled there. It, there's two major service providers are looking to acquire um, his business, um, and. Uh, their revenue is less than a million. Uh, what do you what do you think of this situation? Th that type of situation is is one that we're we're very familiar with. Uh, you know, for example, we we worked on a transaction about a year and a half ago with a, a staffing a healthcare staffing business, and we had been building a relationship with them for about a year year and a half. And uh, I think our view at the time was the, the company was a little bit early to to transact given some of the growth initiatives that were in place. And we would have you know, probably guided them towards a 12, 18 month or so hold period before pursuing a transaction. But they started to get knocks on the door, similar to what it sounds like Aaron's company is here. And you know, we entertained some of those conversations. We saw that you know, given some of the dynamics happening in the market that were outside of the, you know, the considerations specific for what was happening inside the business, it made sense to actually start these conversations maybe a year earlier than, than we otherwise would have. So basically what we did in that situation is we started getting ready on the front end with, with the prep work that we do, which includes the accounting diligence that you know, Escalon would come in and, and do a full, full analysis of the historical financials to, to create a, a normalized view on, on earnings that would be able to be underwritten in the transaction, uh, do upfront legal diligence, preparing the marketing materials, which is the SIM, CIM, Confidential Information Memorandum. And all that work takes two, three, four months. And so while we were getting ready to have broader conversations, we entertained conversations with the parties that had knocked on the door over the last you know, five, six months. And so, you know, those parties were, were in the mix and ultimately, their proposals didn't quite get to the valuation that, that we were expecting. And so then we then launched a broader process to strategics and, and private equity investors. And you know, for, I think we ended up launching around January of, of 22. And then we, we closed that transaction by the end of May of 22. And we ended up selling it to a large, large strategic that was not one of the parties that was initially knocking on the door. Uh, so, you know, this is a situation where we're very familiar with. Often it's those knocks that, and, and most businesses these days are getting knocks like that. The market is very active for, for acquisitions, uh, but it's often those knocks that, that kind of spurns entrepreneurs to pick their heads up and say, hey, you know, maybe there's a, a deal out there. or Maybe there's an investor that, that could make sense for my business. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point you made, Joseph. And um, I think you know what's the most fascinating about business owners is you know how much blood, sweat, and tears go into creating a, a business from scratch. And you know, it's often the work of of their entire lives. Uh, you know, an entrepreneur, founder to to create this this awesome piece of value, store of value. Coming to that point of value, you know, how do you handle questions around a, an owner's uh, view of valuation versus what the market values a particular asset or company at yeah i mean look ultimately the ability to transact it requires that the seller's expectations of value and the buyer's expectations of value there's that there's some overlap and so you know it, it's the work we do on the front end when we're speaking with prospective clients is uh is to basically go through a, a, at, a, at a higher level than what will happen down the road, but a, a, an upfront diligence process, reviewing the financials and understanding trends in the business to share our view of where we think valuation will, will fall in a, in a transaction. And that process allows founders to understand likely kind of the range of, of, of where the market is today. And if that aligns with, with their expectations, then we will we'll go through the process of, of having these conversations. In situations where we share that feedback and uh, the, the feedback from the, the company is that this is not nowhere near the level of valuation that they need in order to transact, then that's when we, we sit down and, and help them think through how to get to that level. How do you, you know, make the right hires, add the right service lines, invest in certain growth initiatives, in order to get there in two, three years. And so, you know, it, it's, it's all, again, it all comes back to getting in there early so we can have that conversation and be well positioned for 2026 versus that individual coming to us in 2026 and us saying, well, I wish, I wish we had this conversation a couple of years ago. Yeah, no, that's a great response. You know, I really appreciate the, the insight there. Um, and one of the things we work on at, at Escalon is, is working with founders to to get them sell side ready from a, a finance accounting HR perspective. Um, you've worked on countless transactions. Um, can you tell us a story about how uh, how important accounting records are in the in the process and, and maybe share a, a cautionary tale about maybe a deal gone awry or something that uh, you know could have been prevented had they had the right accounting advisory? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, Will. I mean, it's it it aside from you know a lot of the 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 key strategic business items around the team, the industry, the historical performance, and then what the next couple of years will look like. Being buttoned up on the on the accounting side is probably the most important diligence item. Um, in addition to uh, the, the legal you know, side of things and making sure there's no red flags from, from, from a legal perspective. But typically I'd say you know, accounting often comes down to kind of a binary um, issue where if we're working with a company and we're far along in a process and the, the books just aren't what, what we thought, uh, that's often just a binary decision that it, the deal is not going to get done. And, you know, this, this 10 years ago, this used to be so, one of the, the most common issues for why businesses weren't able to transact is, you know, we, we would do initial diligence, we would, we, th but down the road, you realize that, you know, there were issues in the accounting and, and the, you know, the companies weren't able to, to transact. Today, the market is much more evolved and mature in the sense that there's, there's firms like Escalon who can get in there early and provide the, the services to prepare the, the financials on a, on a recurring basis. So every month as we're going through the process, we have complete financials and, and also in a timely manner. So we're not waiting 60, 90 days for, for the, the books to get closed. Uh, and then, you know, that goes hand in hand with a, a quality of earnings analysis, which is a, a formal product that is prepared by you know firms like Escalon to to act as a the basis of 
earnings that that you're selling in a, in a transaction. And so every transaction process, for the most part that we, we work on today has a Q of E. And uh, when folks like Escalon are, are in there, it makes us feel a whole lot better about the numbers that, that we're using as the basis for our modeling and, and forecasting. Yeah, I think you make a good point. Um, you know, at Escalon, we work with a lot of business owners that are operating on a, a, a cash hybrid or, or shoebox method of, of accounting. Um, and, and to your point, the you know, this process can take six, 12, 18 months or more. And, and I think it highlights the importance of having gap basis financial statements, audit ready, investor ready, due diligence ready financial statements. Um, I guess an another kind of question that um, I think a lot of founders ask is like, you know, how do you, how do you make yourself more attractive to outside investors? What kind of, what are some steps that uh, business owners can take there? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the, the end of that question? It, it broke up a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, as as a business owner thinks about kind of entering a a process, what are what are some kind of maybe low hanging fruit things that you know you advise clients on to to make their investment more uh, you know uh, attractive to outside capital? Yeah, well, I I think I mentioned a few of them uh, to some degree. I mean, the it all comes down to the valuation and the level of, of attractiveness of a, of a business all comes down to the inherent risk profile of, of, their, of the operations compared to um, the, the expected return on investment for the investor. And so um, having a strong management team reduces the risk profile, having a larger organization with a, a higher level of earnings, more diversified level of earnings, uh, diversification across different service lines, across different geographies. Um, the, uh, the composition of, of earnings, whether there's client concentration, um, the, the margin profile of ser different service lines, those are all things that, that come into consideration when thinking about the risk profile times the, you know, the expected return profile. Um, so th those are strategic business level things that I think are really important to think about. Um, from a, a transaction process, I mean, you really want to understand, you know, what, what has gone on in the business over the last year or two and be able to really clearly articulate why things happened and, and why you pursued certain initiatives and, and why they were successful why you know things maybe didn't go the way you expected and what you've learned from it because this this process is is really a conversation and dialogue around like what is this business and, and where has it been and where is it going and so understanding the last year or two but then even more important understanding the next 12 months because you, know, you mentioned well a minute ago that this process takes a year and you want your financials rolled forward by Escalon every month as you go through this process. Well, when we put together the, the, the initial budget or forecast, we're using historical figures and then we're underwriting the next 12, 18 months. Often we're putting together a five-year forecast. Every month we're rolling, for, we're rolling forward the actual results and we're comparing it to the budget. And guess who else is comparing it to the budget? The investors, right? And so they're, they're not only understanding how is the business performing, but how does the team Think about the business. How 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 good is their pulse on on the next quarter, the next year, and and so it, it's it's really important to understand what's going to happen in the next next twelve months, and then with your investment banker, think through how to position that so you make sure that you're you're forecasting in line with with the exact expected performance. Yeah, I think that makes great sense. Um, I guess, that, you know, just to kind of back up from this and take a like 30,000 foot macro view of it, what does a, what does a typical investment banking process kind of look like? You know, I, you mentioned something uh, called a STEM, confidential information memorandum. Like, you know, can you explain that to me like, um, you know, 10 years old? <laughs> <laughs> the, the SIM is, 
it, it tells the story of the company and why they're they're looking to transact. And it, it can be anywhere from 30 to 70 pages, depending on the situation. But the the key themes are that we're we're highlighting the the founding story of the organization, why this business came into existence, the the problem it solved in the market, and how it's really differentiated and and exciting today, but also now what does the next three, four, five years look like? And how are we going to get from X to Y, Y being two to three times larger in, in a certain period of time? And and so it, it's it's very you know in-depth document, but at, at in its in its essence, it's it's meant to tell the story of of why an investor should be excited to partner with the management team, the ownership, and and you know, invest in, and grow the business with them. Yeah, it sounds, sounds super important. Almost like it's the, uh, you know, the, the, the storybook of the of the owner's book of work um, and presented in a, a positive light for, for investors. Um, I, I, I got uh, another question kind of about the, the investment banking process. Um, can you kind of explain like, you know, the this concept of exclusivity or, or when a uh, uh, a business owner might have exclusivity with a particular investor, and what what does that look like when they're kind of you know further along down that process? Yeah, no, it's a good good question. Uh, and the the thing with with M and A and transactions, there's a lot of terms out there, and uh, you know as you go through it as a founder, you kind of you learn a lot, and by the end you're an expert. And you know a lot of our clients look up the day after closing, they're like, wow, I I learned a lot. I feel like I just went back to school for a year. Um, so the, the concept of exclusivity, let me, that, that's towards the end of the, towards the end of the process as you work towards closing. Let me take a step back and start it on the front end, just so you, you kind of have a sense of the, the full process. Um, so prior to getting formally engaged with a client, I mentioned we'll work to review financial information, understand the business, and then share thoughts around what, what could make sense for, for, for a company and what valuation could look like, what we think makes sense from a timing or a buyer perspective or structural perspective. All of that happens up front and we all get on the same page in terms of what we expect in a transaction and what, what we think makes sense for all parties. Assuming we, we're on the same page, we formally engage as your advisor. And that's when the prep phase starts. That's when we do the quality of, analysis, quality of earnings work, the accounting work with Escalon, and other advisors, including legal, um, you know, and often we'll we'll look at like other consulting firms that can help look at market studies and other research as needed. That whole process to create the sim and do all the other financial work, it could take anywhere from you know six to eight weeks to three four months, and it, it we kind of work backwards from when we expect to, to start conversations with buyers. So we'll call it three or four months of prep, and then once we we quote unquote, go to market, meaning start having conversations with potential investors or buyers, that, that takes about six months, six to eight months through closing. And so the first couple of months of that, of that process are initial conversations that we're having with our relationships at these investment firms. We're helping them do their initial diligence, understand the opportunity. They'll then submit the first stage of an offer, which is called an IOI, indication of interest. Think of that as a, a ticket to a meeting with the, the shareholders and the team, assuming it's it's attractive for us to move forward. So we'll all, from the IOI stage, we'll, we'll often narrow the process down to call it a dozen or so parties that are then meeting with the company in person and, and having substantive conversations, you know, several hours worth of, of meetings with, with, with the, the team to understand the opportunity and do their initial diligence. From there, the parties work towards the next offer deadline, which is an LOI, a letter of intent. Now, from, from that timeline, you know, different processes will, will, will cater them to different situations, but that LOI stage will either have a, what's considered an LOI or a full purchase agreement, which is a, you know, a full uh, legal, you know, 75 page legal document uh, to acquire the, the membership interest or the, 
the uh, the assets of, of the the business. At that stage, that's often when we'll grant what, what's considered exclusivity, and, and basically all that means is we're going from okay, we had a dozen meetings with folks. Let's say half of those parties are still at the the table at the, the end of the process. We then choose a horse, and that that party that we decide to to move forward with is granted exclusivity. So we're saying we will not have conversations with with any other parties, and we'll let you know if if um, you know if, if if someone else reaches out. Like we we're legally obligated to to interact directly with you, and that the reason that's important to the buyer is because their diligence process uh, is is substantial, and they're spending significant dollars on HR diligence, insurance, legal, accounting, um, cybersecurity, different industry consultants, lender fees. I mean, there's there's millions of dollars in, in buy side fees that go into these processes. And so granting them exclusivity allows them the, the comfort to spend that money up front. The exclusivity process, timeline, it's, it's usually somewhere from about 30 to 90 days. And then you work towards closing from there. So that that's that that's what that process indicates. Well, uh, appreciate those insights, Joe. And uh, very well said. And uh, certainly appreciate the time you take in here today to to walk us through uh, what a transaction looks like. Um, wanted to thank everyone for attending today. We're, we're going to wrap here. Leave some time for for Q and A uh, for anyone in the audience. Feel free to. To reach out uh, in the chat, and uh, we'll take a couple of Q of A's. Right, going once, uh, going twice. <laughs> I've answered all questions. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, let's wrap there. Appreciate your time, uh, Joseph. And uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Joseph if you you want a uh, a conversation about you know where you are in your company's life cycle and trajectory and how uh, the team at Trepic can help. Uh, if you want to take a look at your accounting records and see how they they stack up, uh, happy to facilitate a free call to kind of walk through that and take a look at them. Absolutely. Well, well, thank thank you for having me and, and the Escalon team for putting this together. Uh, and thanks to our sponsors, Paycorn Alliance, Kath, uh, Catherine and Dan. Thanks again. Uh, everyone have a great uh, rest of your week. Take care, everyone. Thank you.